thanks a lot. Um, so as the title says, the goal of this talk is twofold. I first want to give a brief introduction into the Univalent Foundations for those who are not familiar with the Univalent Foundations. For those who are familiar with the Univalent Foundations, there will be nothing new in it, in this talk, I'm afraid. And then I want to explain how the equivalence principle holds in the Univalent Foundations. Um, of course, I will explain to you what the equivalence principle is. And um, yeah, this is important. I, I chose this topic because I think the equivalence principle in the Univalent Foundations is one of the um, main reasons why Vladimir, or, or let's say one of the design principles for the uni Univalent Foundations that uh, motivated Vladimir. Um, okay, um, what is the foundation of mathematics? According to Vladimir, it has uh, three ingredients. Firstly, a syntax for mathematical objects. Secondly, a notion of proposition and proof to reason about these mathematical objects. And thirdly, an interpretation of the syntax and of the propositions into a world of mathematical objects. So uh, fortunately, Andre Choyal yesterday has talked already about the third point. So in my talk today, I will present the syntax of the univalent foundations and its notion of proposition and proof. And then uh, I will explain how the equivalence principle holds, uh, can be shown for a variety of mathematical structures in the univalent foundations. Um, so since this is supposed to be um, an, an introductory talk or something, a tutorial style talk, please feel free to interrupt me at any time. Just shout out, okay? Um, okay, so this is the outline of my talk. I will first give a, a brief, like an intuition for what the equivalence principle is. Then I will present dependent type theory as it was um, conceived by Per Martin Löw in the 70s. And as a third point, I will uh, present some concepts that Vladimir came up with on top of uh, dependent uh, Martin Löw type theory that turns it into univalent type theory. Um, and the fourth and the fifth part are concerned with the equivalence principle, uh, well, for set level structures first and then for um, more complicated mathematical structures. Okay, so what is the equivalence principle? Let's start with this uh, logical principle. It says that if two things, whatever thing means here, x and y are equal, then they share the same properties. Um, this is an, a very uh, uncontentious reasoning principle in logic. And so this principle says that reasoning in logic is invariant under equality. So anything we do, uh, we can replace a thing by an equal thing and the reasoning will be uh, still valid. In mathematics, however, um, that's, this principle is not very useful and we would like um, reasoning to be invariant under a weaker thing, thing than equality. For instance, um, what uh, could we hope for? Well, for it, it, it should be invariant under a notion of sameness that is adapted to the objects under consideration. So that means if we reason about numbers of functions, then equality is the right notion of sameness. But if we reason about sets or groups, then we don't want our reasoning to be invariant under equality of sets or, uh, or of uh, groups, but under isomorphism. Okay, this in set theory is a strictly weaker notion. Um, if you go up the uh, to, to higher categorical structures, the right notion of same as for categories would be equivalence, or etron equivalence of categories, um, and so on. So the equivalence principle says, to summarize, reasoning in mathematics should be invariant under the appropriate notion of sameness um, uh, for the objects under consideration. Um, in classical mathematics, the uh, equivalence principle is not enforced. So we can easily write statements that are not invariant under this, the, the correct notion of sameness. For instance, can you find a statement about categories that is not invariant under this equivalence that I've drawn here? So that is true for one of the categories, but not for the other. Number of objects. 
Number of objects, perfect. Um, so one could say this is not a very mathematical, not a mathematical statement at all, and mathematicians would not be generally interested in counting the number of objects in a category. Um, Pierre de Ligne might disagree, but let's see. Um, so Michael Mackay was also very concerned with this problem. And in his um, article, or actually a long monograph, towards the categorical foundation of mathematics, he wrote the following. The basic character of the principle of isomorphism is that of a constraint on the language of abstract mathematics, a welcome one since it provides for the separation of sense from nonsense. So uh, Mackay's goal was to devise a language in which only invariant statements um, and properties uh, and constructions could be expressed. And this, in turn, inspired um, Vladimir very much. And he says um, the following in an email to Dan Grayson in 2006. My homotopy lambda calculus is an attempt to create a system which is very good at dealing with equivalences. In particular, it is supposed to have the property that given any type expression f of t, depending on a term sub-expression t of type t, and an equivalence uh, between those uh, from t to t prime. There's a mechanical way to create a new expression f prime, now depending on t prime and an equivalence between f of t and f prime of t prime. Well, it's all very complicated, but uh, the, the gist is that uh, Vladimir wants to transport uh, statements and proofs uh, of certain facts along an equivalence of, of objects, t and t prime. Yeah. Um, so, that's the tiny introduction to the equivalence principle. Now, in the second part, I will explain uh, what is type theory. And this will be a very brief introduction, very terse. Um, hopefully, you will get an idea of what it looks like to work in, in type theory. Um, so what is type theory? It can be described. One way to describe it is to say it's a functional programming language um, that has types and terms. And in addition to that, it also has an infrastructure to write mathematical statements and proofs. Um, as people have already done yesterday, we saw it in Andre's talk, uh, we will write terms and types like this with a tiny a is usually a term. And we will write uh, a colon a to say that tiny a is a term that has type capital A. So for instance, uh, in this language, one would write things like one colon nut to say that the term one is a term of type uh, nut, which is a type of natural numbers. So what is very important is that in type theory, um, the sole activity we do is writing well-typed programs. Both implementing an algorithm and proving a mathematical statement are done by writing well-typed programs. Now, what is the particularity about dependent types? What are they good for? Why are, uh, you might have programmed in, in C or in, even in Haskell, uh, there are no dependent types. Why, are, why would we be interested in dependent types? What do they add uh, um, with uh, compared to, to simpler programming languages? Well, we can express certain invariants, as we will see here. Uh, first of all, the purpose of dependent types is to write dependent functions. So. For instance, we could consider a dependent type of vectors. So vect a n uh, could be a type of vectors of length n, where n is a, is, a, is a term of natural number type. And the elements of that uh, vector could be taken from a. Or another example of a dependent type uh, would be this type group stru, which stands for group structure on x, where x is a set. I will explain later what a set is in the univalent foundations. And uh, so group structure on X is the type of group structures on a set X. And once we have these types, we can write functions uh, uh, using those dependent types. For instance, we could write a function zero, the body of which I haven't given here, but its type would be, well, this, this pi I will explain later should be read as a for all. So for all uh, natural numbers M, uh, zero would be um, deliver a vector um, over the natural numbers of type, uh, of length m. So this could be 
a function that for any natural number m returns a vector full of zeros of length m. Yeah? Um, doesn't look very useful as such. More useful looks the second example where we could write a function tail um, that takes as input a natural number n and a vector of length 1 plus n over um, a base type a and returns, well, the tail of the vector, which is a vector of length uh, n. So here in this, um, here the type of this function serves to encode a, an invariant of the, of the tail function, namely that it shortens the input by one. So the output is one uh, shorter than the input, okay? This is something that um, otherwise in, in a language like uh, um, Haskell one could show, but actually uh, there's a second purpose here. We can actually uh, not just encode this invariant, we can also restrict the input to our function to vectors that has, have length uh, at least one. Yeah? And the, the third example of a function, of a dependent function that we could write down is a group structure transfer where that uh, takes as input, well, two sets, um, X and Y, and an isomorphism between them and a group structure on X, and that returns a group structure on Y by transferring it um, along this uh, isomorphism of sets. Okay. So, when yeah? When you're talking about isomorphism, is it a like, concrete map? Well, what I mean here is um, a pair of maps back and forth from X to Y um, th that are inverse to each other. Yeah. But it, it's not important for the time being what I really mean by, by, the, by these isomorphisms. Okay, so that's um, why, would, why one would be interested in dependent types. Now I wanna be a bit more formal and explain type theory. Um, uh, the technicalities of type theory a little bit by introducing, by explaining to you what are judgments, inference rules, and derivations. And after that, I will give a, an overview of the type constructors that are available in, in some, say, basic Martin Love type theory that we will later extend to um, the univalent foundations, to turn uh, into the univalent foundations. So um, the very important um, notion that also Andre talked about yesterday is that of a judgment. Um, a judgment is a thing like this. It consists of two parts, a context and a conclusion that is separated often by this turnstile. Um, and the context is a thing that is simple enough. It is just a sequence of variable declarations. So for instance here, we have, um, uh, we declare a variable x1 of type a1 and the variable x2 of type a2, and now here, what I mean by this is that in the type A2, the variable x1 can occur freely because it has been declared earlier, and so on. So it's a finite sequence of variables, and here xn of type an, where an can depend on all the previously de declared variables. And in such a context, we then have three, uh, four, sorry, um, different kinds of conclusions. The first conclusion uh, reads as, a is a well-formed type in context gamma. The second reads as tiny a is a well-formed term in context gamma and it has type capital A. And the third and fourth concern equality or convertibility as we call it um, between types and terms of the same type respectively. Um, here's an in, an, a simple instance of a judgment, an example um, uh, variable x of type natural numbers, uh, f is uh, declared to be a, f a function type, a function from the naturals to the booleans, and then f at x, um, we can, uh, well, we, uh, we can write down f at x of type bool, and then the question is, is that a judgment that we can derive? And this is um, what we will discuss and now. Uh, the question is, can such a judgment be derived um, and is it such, uh, such a, a valid judgment? Um, first of all, how does the dependency come into this? Um, the dependency, the dependent types 
occur like as follows. So for instance, suppose we have a variable x of type A and we have a type B, and here I write B of x to say that x may occur freely in, in B, then B is a type, is actually it's not one type, but it's a type family depending uh, on the variable x, or it's a family of types indexed by A. Um, importantly, a type can depend on several variables. So we've already seen this vec type um, uh, vect that depends on both, well, a type that is itself an, a term in a, in, in, uh, somewhere that I will explain later, and it depends on a term of type natural numbers. And then vect an um, is a dependent type, is a type family. This one here? Um, I write this just to say that x may occur freely in B. So B is, at, is an expression that in which x can occur freely. It's often customary, I, I hesitated when I prepared the slides, to write the x or to not write it. Um, It, it, when I write b of x, I mean that b is a type family that depends on a parameter in A. Hopefully, it will become clearer in, in the following. Is vect also a type? Um, vect is a type that we could declare to be uh, primitive in our type theory. It, it could also be a type that we define using other type constructors that I will present. Yeah. For the time being, I'm not, I haven't committed to a specific type theory. I'm just um, giving examples of types that we might either put in the type theory as, as primitive or that we can construct from other type constructors. Okay, so um, here's a, a picture of a dependent type, not very exciting. Um, we have a, a type A, a, a base type A, and then we have elements or terms in A called A and A prime, and for each uh, of these, we do have another type that we think of lying over it, um, B of A. So this would mean B, B where we substitute the free variable X by A, and here we have B of A prime, which would be uh, B where we substitute the free variable X occurring in there by the term A prime. And here we could have a term B in B of A prime, well, that lies in here somewhere. Okay. Um, now, the um, notion of inference rule uh, tells us how to derive a new judgment given some old, some, some, some hypothesis, some judgments that we have shown earlier. Um, so an inference rule is an implication of judgments where we have one uh, judgment in the in the bottom, and a number of judgments in the top. So, for instance, this could be an inference rule um, uh, saying that if f is a term of type a r o b in some context gamma, and a is a term of type a, then f at a, uh, which is function application, uh, is a term of type b. Another inference rule here could be um, that if A is of type A and A is equal to B, then A is also of type B. Now, these are just examples of inference rules. Um, in the following, I will not usually write inference rules like this, but I will um, say them in prose like this. If A and A and A equals B, then A is of type B would be um, what I say to describe this inference rule. And as you can see here, I never mentioned the context here, this because the context is the same in, in all the different judgments, so um, I'm being sloppy about this and don't mention the context, yeah. Sorry? Yeah, these three bars are judgmental equality. Thanks a lot, that's uh, good to emphasize. They don't have anything to do with the identity type um, yet that we have seen. Um, for the time being, I haven't introduced any types. Thanks. Okay, so once we have a set of inference rules that um, describe the basic steps of reasoning that we 
uh, can do in uh, our type theory. We can uh, write derivations. Actually, we don't write the derivations. It's the, the computer program usually that finds derivations for us or, or fails to find derivations for us. So here's a derivation of this judgment, which says that in context X, uh, in context X and F, F at X is of type B. And here's a derivation of that um, judgment. Uh, for this, to derive this, we first, if I go back, we use this rule that I've written down here. Um, so we have to show that F is of type um, a R O B in this context, and we have to show that X is of type A. But in, and then uh, here, we can just use a weakening rule, which says that, well, for to show this, it suffices to show that in context X, colon A, X is of type A. And this is um, an, another inference rule that we will put in our type theory. Um, and here we can, for instance, swap these two um, we can swap elements in the context that don't depend on each other. And then we can use another instance of weakening uh, to deduce that in context F uh, of this type, F is, well, has this type, yeah. Um, so we say that a term A, I, I said at the beginning, our goal is to write well-typed programs, yeah. So we usually will write a term A, um, that we hope to be of a given type A. And we will ask the computer, well, is this indeed the case? And the computer will try to find a derivation then of this judgment, which says gamma entails that A is of type A. And if the computer succeeds in deriving this judgment, then I'm happy and uh, I have succeeded in writing a term of the type that I'm uh, supposed to, to write. Okay. Um, are there any questions so far? Well, yeah. So, well typedness is not supposed to be something like in Java that you can just check by reading the program at a simple level. It's something to be found, a proof of it to be found. Is this somehow the most, uh, the most significant achievement of type theory? I'm not sure I have understood the question correctly. Um, so, checking whether a term has a given type is something that the machine does for us, a computer program, um, a type checker. Just like in, in, in Haskell, you would write a program and the, the compiler would tell you whether uh, the program you are, are writing or have written is of the type that you have a, uh, that you want it to be. Yeah. Um, so my question is, could it be difficult to check whether a pro program is well typed? Um, it depends on what you mean by difficult. Um, Well-behaved type theories have decidable type checking. So there is a com the computer. There is a, an algorithm that is, in some sense, complete. Will give you an answer um, that will return yes if the if and only if the term has the given type. Um, most uh, computer proof systems based on type theory have decidable type checking. I think the only example that I know of um, might be New Perl that has, has uh, undecidable type checking. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so if you have never heard of type theory, um, before, you might wonder whether this colon here has anything to do with the epsilon that you're used to. And the answer is yes, well, it, it could be. So we can interpret types in terms of sets. And in this interpretation, um, the, the colon would indeed be translated to an epsilon. But I want to point out a few differences that are important that you might want to keep in mind between the colon and the epsilon. Um, firstly, the judgment um, in context gamma A is of type A. Is, that's, it's not a, a mathematical statement that you prove or disprove. It's, as I said, um, it's, it's something that the computer decides for us, okay? And 
there is no way we can make an effort to convince the computer. It, it's either uh, the computer decides for us whether this is the case or not. Um, furthermore, a term A does not exist independently of its type A. So whenever a term tiny A is well formed, it's, it's well formed because it has a valid type. Yeah, so um, every term automatically is born into, into some type. Um, and then a term has exactly, any term has exactly one type up to this, up to this um, convertibility, judgmental equality. Okay, so now that you know what inference rules are and derivations and so on, um, I would like to show you some of the types that are available in Martin Love type theory to, to work with. Um, the rules of type theory, one can separate them, one can um, distinguish them between uh, the infrastructural rules, substitution and weakening and so on, which are mostly very boring and I will not discuss them, and the logical rules, which allow you to build new t types and terms. Um, and the logical rules that allow us to build, to form new types or explain how to form new types and terms, they usually come in packages of four. Um, a formation rule, which gives a way to construct a type, an introduction rule, which gives a way to construct canonical terms of that type, an elimination rule, which tells you how to use a term of this, of this new type to construct other uh, terms, and a computation rule, which tells us how this elimination behaves on canonical terms. Yeah? We will go through this um, several times and you might, we will get used to it very quickly. The first example of a type that is usually in margin of type theory, however, does not adhere to this uh, coming in package of force. It's the universes. Namely, there is also a type that is called type and its elements are types itself. So types are types, but they are also terms of another type, which is the type type. Um, if we have such a type type, then any dependent, um, the dependent type that we have seen earlier, like uh, B, a, de a dependent type in, uh, over A, uh, can be considered as a function from A into this type of types. So we would write lambda x dot B um, for this dependent type B. To avoid some paradoxes, um, we usually have a hierarchy of types uh, indexed by some indexing set, for instance, the natural numbers. And in this talk, I will not go into this technical detail and I will usually just write type to denote some, some of these, uh, some universe here. Um, and coming back to this example about vectors, we could, once we have this universe, we can write, we could reformulate this by saying in context A and N, uh, vect A N is a term of type type. Yeah. Okay. Now, the singleton type that I want to introduce now is the first type constructor that does adhere, um, that we see that does adhere to this coming in package of force. Uh, this is a reminder of what the purpose of these different uh, uh, rules is. And for the singleton type, the formation rule just says that one is a type, and I'm omitting the context here, by which I mean that one is a valid type in any context. Um, introduction rule says that T is a canonical term of type one. The elimination rule says that, um, well, if I have a variable of type one, and if C is a type, and C is a term of type C, then rec 1 C, C, X is of type C. So this corresponds to the intuition that in order to give a map from, uh, from one into, into another type C, it suffices to specify its image um, on one, it suffices to specify one element in C, which is this tiny C. And the computation rule then says that um, this uh, function that I'm, declare, that, I'm, that I'm obtaining here, uh, if x, the variable here, uh, if it is, if I replace it by t, by the canonical term, then indeed I get the value c back that I have put in here, okay? What is the 
Um, Canonical, for the purpose of this talk, it just means that it's not a variable or one of these um, recursors. It's, it's a, um, um, how to say it? It's of a, a, a given standard shape. For instance, uh, for a term of natural number type, we want it to be either zero or the successor of some other uh, natural number. And um, an example of a non-canonical term would be a variable because for a variable I don't know whether it's, if it's zero or successor. Um, another uh, type that I want to introduce is the type of dependent pairs, sigma AB. The formation rule says um, if B is a type um, dependent on A, then sigma AB is a new type, uh, and it lives now in, in a smaller context. I've omitted the context here, but uh, think of this as B living in, a, in context gamma plus the variable X of type A, then this type sigma AB just lives in the context gamma. So it, is, it does not depend on A anymore. The introduction rule says that uh, in order to make a term of that pair type, um, I, I can use an element in a term of type A and a term B here of type B of A, and then pair AB gives me a canonical term in that type. Now, if I have any pair, any term of, pair, of this pair type, sigma AB, then I can take the first projection and obtain an element in A, and I can take a second projection and obtain an element in B of first projection of that term. And the computation rule says that if I build a pair from some A and some B and then take the first or the second projection, then I get the, well, the first or the second element out that I have put in. As a special case, if this is not a real dependency, if B doesn't occur, if X doesn't occur in B, then uh, this, the, the, the this type of dependent pairs gives just the Cartesian product A times B. Here's a, a, the sigma, a sigma type sigma AB in, in pictures. It's this union of all the types of all these, um, well, fibers um, over, over, over the base type A. So here we have an example of a canonical uh, term A prime comma B, the pair A prime B. Um, where this A prime is in A, and the B is the B that we saw earlier living in uh, B of A prime. So this pair A, A, A prime B is a canonical term in sigma AB. Um, we also have a type of functions, pi AB. The formation rule is very similar to that for, for the sigma, for the dependent pairs. If B is a type family over A, then pi AB is a type. And the introduction rule says that if I have a term B in a context X, and I can do what we call lambda abstraction, which is like um, uh, with, uh, write lambda X uh, dot B, and that is of type pi AB. If I have any term of function type, of this dependent function type pi AB, then I can apply it. So this is another um, term that is introduced here, the, the application at. And f at a is a term uh, which is of type b, where I replace the, the free variable x by the input a. As a special case, if b does not depend on a, I get the regular function type a r o b. And the computation rule says that, well, if I have this, uh, if I make build a function by using this lambda abstraction and then apply it to some input a, then I obtain the, the body of the function B back uh, where I have to replace now the variable X that, uh, that um, B depends on um, by the input A, okay? So here's a picture of a dependent function. If F is such a dependent function, then um, F of A will be a term of type B of A. Um, 
f of a prime will be a term of type uh, b of a prime. Okay, and the last type that I want to introduce is the identity type that which says that, that the formation rule says that if a and b are terms of type, say a, then it a b is a type. Introduction rule says that if a is a term of type a, then the reflexivity term is an identity, is a term of identity type from a to a prime. And the elimination rule is a bit complicated to read. It says that if I want to inhabit a type that depends on three variables x, y, and p, where p is an identity from x to y, um, then it suffices to <coughs> inhabit it on the diagonal, meaning uh, for any, uh, it suffices to inhabit it for at the, in C of x, x, and reflexivity of x. The computation rule uh, then just says that if I uh, take this induction, this int term here, and plug in x, x, and reflexivity, I get in the T of x that I put in in the beginning. Okay. Here are some terms that can be defined. Um, so here are some types for which we can define uh, terms in them. Uh, the identity type from false to false, what would be a valid term of that type? Well, reflexivity on false would be a term of type identity false false. Okay, the second example, uh, identity type the id second uh, and of t and false and false. What would be a valid term of that type? The, so again, reflexivity of false would be a, a term of this type because second t and false is something that can be computed according to the computation rules for pairs that we saw. So second t and false will compute to false and then uh, this type, so actually what happens is that this type here is convertible to this type here. And we saw earlier that if a ter term has, so if a term has this type, then it also has this type since these two types are convertible. Um, we can also construct terms of, uh, of this type here, um, which is a, a function from it x, y to it y, x for any x and y, um, which basically means, uh, so the, the way it works is um, by the elimination principle for the identity, we can assume that um, y is actually x and that this guy here is reflexivity, the, inpu the input here, and then we can uh, map the reflexivity on x to, well, here again, the reflexivity on x. And transitivity works the same. Um, we have one very important term that I will use all the time later that uh, we want to use is a transport. Um, transport is a term uh, that takes first an identity from x to y and then returns for any um, dependent type on A, where A is the type of x and y, um, maps back and forth between B of x and B of y. So this, um, if you uh, think back to the um, identity, uh, to the uh, indiscernibility of identicals from the very first slide, or one of the slides at the beginning, this is exactly that. Um, so whenever two guys are identical, x and y, then they uh, share all the same properties. Yeah? So I'm just perplexed by something like id is false, false. If false is not a type, so if we're thinking of identity, how can we have something like this? So, yeah, false is not a type. False is a term of type bool, and actually I made a mistake because I haven't introduced the type bool. But false is a term of type bool, and for any two terms of a given type, I can form the identity type um, between those two terms. Um, here, here. So take here capital A to be bool, and A and B to be false. Then, I, then I know that it false false is a type. Um, well, we could ask whether any, of, whether any identity type has just one term. Okay. 
Um, that's something that I will actually come to right now. Uh, so inhabitants of this it identity type behave like equality in many ways, namely we have this reflexivity, we have something called symmetry or whether we can think of symmetry and transitivity that I've just shown. And we have this transport, which is this uh, indiscernibility of identicals. But in, one, in, in, in some aspects, in two aspects at least, they, they behave unlike equality. Namely, we can iterate the identity type, um, which is something we, that we cannot do in, in classical mathematics, where we don't think about equalities between equalities. And we cannot show here that any two identities are identical. Yeah? Um, so uh, at this point, you, there are basically three options. You can either do nothing about this, or you can um, choose to add an axiom to your type theory that says that any two terms of an identity type are identical themselves. Um, or we can do, well, what Vladimir suggested, take, uh, adding the univalence axiom that I will come to um, that is incompatible with the second option that I mentioned. Okay, so here, we don't want to consider all the elements of identity type to be the same, so we will think of them rather as paths from x to y, and so instead of writing it x, y, I will now use this arrow, um, this squiggly arrow to, 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 that should resemble, like make you think of paths from x to y, okay? So this is an overview of the type theory, of a, a very basic type theory that one could use and then turn into univalent foundations, which is the topic of the next section. I'm uh, a bit behind, so I will speed up. Um, Dan Grayson yesterday has already mentioned um, what Vladimir uh, considered to be the most important aspect of univalent foundations instead of homotopy levels. So we have um, we, we can introduce, in, in the type theory that we have um, presented so far, we can introduce the concept of a type being contractible. And this would be um, this following type. So A is contractible if we can firstly exhibit an element in A and then exhibit a function that to any uh, point in A associates a path from that point to the, to the, um, to the uh, type, to the term X that we exhibited at the beginning that is a contractible type. So we think of a contractible type as a, as a singleton type, as a, having exactly one element up to, up to this um, path um, relation. Um, a is a proposition if any two elements, um, if there's a function assigning to any two elements a path between them, and A is a set if um, the path type for any two, between any two terms in A is a proposition. And then we get a, a type of propositions and a type of sets as um, a, a type of pairs of a type together with a proof that it's a proposition or it's a set, respectively. And um, once we have the notion of contractibility, we can define what it means for a map or a function f from A to B to be an equivalence. And that is if it has contractible fibers. So, this is the formal definition. Um, essentially, it says that uh, F is an equivalence if for any B, the type of pairs of an element in A together with a path from F to A to that B is contractible. And the type of equivalence is then, is a type of maps, is a type of pairs give, oh, consisting of a map from A to B together with a proof that it is an equivalence. Um, with this notion of equivalence, we can revisit the transport that I defined earlier and reformulate it slightly by saying, well, transport is now a function that takes a path that hasn't changed, but it does not give just a by um, implication between B of X and B of Y, but it gives an equivalence of types between um, B of X and B of Y, um, which is uh, stronger than what I wrote before, okay? Um, now, we have introduced many um, type constructions that allow us to build complicated new types from, from old types, from, from more basic types. For instance, the pair type, the, the pair type construct, the Cartesian product, say. Um, 
we can, oh, we can try to understand what an identity between two pairs is. Yeah? And one can show, using this notion of equivalence here, one can show that if I have two pairs, S and T, then a path or an identity from S to T is actually a pair of paths between the first and the second components, respectively. Yeah? And if, if we go to um, the more complex, the more complicated case of a dependent, um, dependent pair, sigma AB, then the same result holds, except so, so the, in the sense that a, pair, uh, a path from S to T is a pair of paths between, well, first, the first components of S and T, and then for the second components, uh, so second S does not have the same type as second of T, um, but we can transport second of S suitably along this path E here that we have, and then uh, obtain a path from this transported second S to second of T. Yeah, so this is just a slight generalization of this guy here. Um, unfortunately, a similar characterization for complicated path types is not possible in the type theory that I have presented. Um, and in order to achieve such a characterization, we have to add some axioms. For instance, for uh, function types, consider functions f and g from a to b, uh, we would hope that a path from f to g or, or paths from f to g are equivalent to maps that assign to any A in A um, a path from F of A to G of A. This is just corresponds to the usual intuition of what equality of functions means. So they should be pointwise, they should be equal if they are pointwise equal. Um, so this is not provable in the type theory that I've presented, and one can instead add an axiom that says, well, there is a canonical map from left to right. And we could add the axiom that says that this canonical map is an equivalence. And similar um, for, for types A and B, if A and B are types, then we could think, we, could, we, would, we would hope that a path between A and B corresponds to an equivalence from A to B. And this, again, this is not the case, but this is exactly what uh, Bobotsky's univalence axiom says. The canonical map here from left to right is an equivalence. And then it turns out that actually it suffices to add this axiom uh, about types, the univalence axiom, uh, because Vladimir showed that this axiom implies the uh, axiom of function extensionality. And as such, we get a complete characterization of the path types of complicated um, types in terms of um, paths of the, of the constituent types. Okay. Um, finally, the equivalence principle for for set level structures. What do I mean by that? So what, what, what is the goal here? We have, I've shown this, we have a transport which says that whenever two guys are related by a path, we have a path from X to Y, then they have the same uh, properties and the same constructions available on them. Now, what we want, depending on what, what we would like, to do is to replace this path, uh, because it is seemingly too strong, um, by a, a more suitable notion of, of uh, sameness between X and Y that depends on, on what kind of objects X and Y are. Yeah, that was the goal at the very beginning. So in order to do this here, it, it, it would suffice if you could show that the path type between X and Y is equivalent to the type of isomorphisms from X to Y. And a bit more precisely, um, we would hope, we don't want just any, any equivalence here between the two. We would like one that, um, we would actually like to show that, there, that the canonical map from the path to the isomorphisms that maps the identity path, the reflexivity path, to the identity isomorphism, that that guy is an equivalence itself. Yeah? Oh, so for, uh, for any B, for any type family, think of B as a predicate on A. Um, this means that predicate B is true on X, if and only if it's true on Y. Yeah. 
Okay. And if it's not predicated, it's more difficult. Well, if it's more, if it's if it's not a proposition, if it's not a proposition here, but just any type, then you can think of this as a transfer of structure. Um, for instance, think of B as group structures on 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 a set. So if A is set, and B as associates to any set, it, the group structures on X, and this means that if X and Y are isomorphic sets, then the group structures on X are equivalent to the group structures on Y. Yeah. Okay. So let's consider the example of monoids. Um, what's a monoid in type theory? Traditionally in set theory, a monoid is a triple of a, a set, a multiplication, and a unit satisfying certain axioms. In type theory, um, the axioms are actually part of the of the uh, of the structure of a monoid. So in, t in type theory, a, a monoid is a, is a tuple, a six tuple, consisting of well, the, the, the carrier, the multiplication, and the unit, and um, paths of a suitable type or families of paths that witness um, well the axioms of a monoid. Important here, why do we ask M to be a set in the sense that I said earlier that it has um, that its, um, its path types are propositions. Um, well, think of it abstractly. Uh, a monoid is a, a dependent pair, data and proof, where data is the, the first uh, three gadgets here, the carrier and the multiplication and the unit, and proof is a triple uh, alpha lambda rho that witnesses the axioms. What we want is that two monoids are the same if, well, if the underlying data is the same. So this means that we would need proof and proof prime to be elements of a proposition so that they are automatically uh, equal. Yeah? Uh, this, however, since proof and proof prime are talking about uh, paths between uh, terms in M, uh, we can guarantee that this proof and proof prime are elements of a proposition whenever M is a set. So here it's very important for what follows that we restrict ourselves uh, to carriers, carrier types that do form a set. So to summarize a monoid, the type of monoids is the type of um, tuples consisting of a set, a type that is a set, um, then a monoid structure mu and E, and um, the type of, uh, well, um, proof of the axioms of a monoid. And so it's important here that we can show that this type uh, is a proposition. Um, now the goal is to compare identities between or paths between monoids to isomorphisms between monoids. So if we have two monoids, M and M prime, what is an isomorphism, a monoid isomorphism? Well, it's a bijection between the underlying sets that preserves uh, mu and E, okay? The multiplication at the neutral element. Uh, now we can do this tiny calculation in type theory. And well, uh, let's start with this path type here. If M, the, path, the type of path from M to M prime, uh, I've just explained that we can discard the proof part of it. The proof part is not relevant for these paths. So this type of path is equivalent to the type of path between those triples. And then I have explained how such a, a, a path between triples is the same as a triple of paths, just by iterating the fact that a path between uh, uh, pairs is a pair of paths. So this path type is equivalent to a, a, a type of triples of paths between, well, the first component, so we need a path from M to M prime, the underlying sets, and then it's, it's not, well typed to say that mu should be, that, that to have a path from mu to mu prime wouldn't be well typed because they are not um, structures on the same uh, carrier set. So we have to transport the mu to compare it to mu prime and the same for E. And now by the univalence axiom, we can replace this identity here, this path, by an isomorphism or an equivalence of types from M to M prime. And these transports here, they translate to a, a sort of conjugation with, with this, um, with this, with this um, isomorphism between M and M prime. And this by definition is the type of isomorphisms between M and M prime. 
So to summarize, we have now two things. We have this transport that we have er from, that is uh, defined, um, that's just a consequence of, of, the, uh, of the rules for this path type. And we have shown that this path type is actually equivalent to the type of isomorphisms between monoids. So if we compose these, we get a transport that uh, allows us to transport um, any, any structure B across an, a, an isomorphism of monoids. So uh, put differently, we, we, we cannot write, uh, uh, we cannot express um, constructions uh, B on, on monoids that do not transfer across an, an isomorphism of monoids. Okay, a, a very, the same kind of reasoning can be done for all sorts of uh, set level structures. And there's a paper by Terry Cocon and uh, uh, co-worker uh, Niels Daniels, Daniel Anderson um, where they make this um, more systematic and where they give a notion of signature for set level structures for which this transfer works. Now, um, what about categories? If we consider categories, then we would hope that a similar result holds according to what I said at the beginning, we want to have that, uh, we want to have a, a sort of transfer along, along structure, um, of, uh, we want to have a transfer of structure along a, a suitable notion of sameness. So for, for categories, a suitable notion of sameness for that would be that of an adjoint equivalence. So our goal would be to prove that paths from C to D where C and D are categories um, are, uh, are, uh, are equivalent to adjoint equivalences between C and D. Uh, but this is not correct. So there's a simple counterexample here, um, which shows that we can have two categories for which we have an adjoint equivalence between them. These categories are equivalent, but they are not, uh, there is no path between the two categories because if there were a path between the two, then in particular there would be a path between their objects. So we would have a path between a one, between a, a one object, uh, between a singleton type and say the type of Booleans. And that would lead to a contradiction. So I will skip a lot of that stuff um, and just come to the very, uh, to, to a theorem that one can show. Namely, if we restrict to a certain kind of category that I haven't had time to talk about, I mean to univalent categories, um, then we can show that paths between them correspond are, are equivalent to adjoint equivalences between them. So um, this univalence condition, it essentially um, it, it, it's, a, it's a sort of a local univalence condition that says that in the category C and in the category D, um, paths between objects correspond to isomorphisms between objects. So if C and D are well behaved in that sense, that uh, paths between their objects are the same as isomorphisms between their objects, then we get a sort of global univalence, which is uh, th this thing here where we say, well, paths between the categories themselves uh, are in one-to-one -one or are equivalent to type of adjoint equivalences between them. Um, okay, as a sort of wrap up and conclusion, in univalent type theory, the equivalence principle can be proved for various set level mathematical structures. This is what I explained in the, for the case of monoids. Um, however, if we go uh, to higher categorical structures, for instance, for to categories which form a bicategory and not a category, then the equivalence principle only holds for a particular kind of category, I mean the univalent categories. And inspired by this, we can hope to generalize this to, a, to other higher categorical structures, to objects that form uh, the objects of a, of a higher category by generalizing suitably the notion of univalent. But this uh, hasn't been done yet, or oh, it's work in progress. And um, I want to point out that Vladimir recognized that working in a foundation where it's impossible to say, to, to say non-invariant things um, would maybe be, maybe it was after a conversation with Pierre Delinia that he uh, thought about this. 
um, he, he, well, at least Vladimir recognized the need for a system where we can talk about um, strict equality, where we can talk about um, things that are not invariant under isomorphism. Um, so he came up with a homotopy type system and that has then been um, continued and, and variants of that have been developed uh, by Capriotti as a, under the name of two-level type theory where one has an additional layer or a layer around um, the fragment that I've presented here in which one can say, well, potentially silly things. Um, so that allows leaving the univalent world, as I say here. And then there's a question, of course, can we go back into the univalent world? Um, and um, I don't know much about it, but I think in this um, work by Capriotti, he gives a conservativity result about that, that tells us something about if we leave this univalent world and come back to it, what, what is still valid. Okay, thanks a lot. <laughs>